Hey everybody, really glad to have you back. Uh, a very popular guest on our show, often requested, uh, and the viewings are always high. A former member of GATA that was uh, essentially advancing the case of gold as true money. Um, Bill Holter, delighted to have you back. Bill, how are you doing? Good, Francis. Thanks for having me back. What's, uh, what a start to the year. I mean, since we last spoke, um, we've had gold breakouts from its support level on 2000. It's put the better part of $400 on. Um, we obviously had the events of the last hour last Friday that were kind of interesting. I don't know where to start with you, uh, but why don't you take us through your your take on the on the recent action, both gold, silver, debt, and the world as you see it in your eyes. Yeah, well, we can start with debt. Debt obviously is exploding. Uh, there, the, the Treasury, they're actually uh, borrowing an extra trillion dollars every 100 days now. So we, we're in the exponential phase as far as the debt buildup. And understand that the reason asset prices are where they are or where they got to was fueled by credit. It was fueled by debt. And what's happening now is uh, we're, we're basically at the debt saturation level where, and I say debt saturation, all you have to do is look at the debt service in the U.S. It's, it was over a trillion uh, last oh, year for, for just, right, just the interest alone. We'll probably end this year, I don't know, 1.5, 1.6 trillion. Mathematically, it doesn't work. Uh, historically, the way to uh, the way to reflate, if you will, historically has been war, and obviously that's on the front burner now with what's going on with with Iran and Israel. Uh, my comment on the on the uh, Iran Israel situation. Yesterday we saw. Uh, a lot of the pundits saying, well, you know, that's all there was. Iran really doesn't have a punch. I view it differently. I ran through a bunch of different uh, armaments toward Israel. And I think I think uh, the, the first salvo was basically a test, if you will. When I say a test, Iran yeah. got to see all of the defense systems that were put up by Israel and the West. So yeah. if you want to call it, you know, the first paw jab or whatever to start a fight, I think that's, I think it was a testing phase and we'll see what happens from here. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Israel now talking about a retaliation on a retaliation. Um, we know this kind of this political Zionism, the war feeds inflation. It'll certainly, in due course, feed through the oil price. It's obviously feeding the big fat calves of uh, the military-industrial complex. Uh, America's actually funded both sides to some degree under Biden, I'm understanding as well. So it is a, a, a debt jubilee of expenditure to to pay two fighters, two prize fighters, to put on a fight uh, that you've essentially funded. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, it feels to me we're in the quickening phase, doesn't it? You mentioned parabola, and I entirely agree. In fact, there's very little uh, when you come on that I don't uh, find alignment with. Um, we seem to be in a quickening phase because, as you pointed out, the interest rate payments can't be paid. Uh, they're, they're having to roll. The debt is shortening, so there's much more debt that needs to be rolled. We're actually in the phase where the appetite for that debt, there was 62% from foreign buyers actually on a very poor bid in the last uh, the last issuance, a very, very poor bid. And I wonder if you took out Japan that is strong armed into buying and Britain, that's part of the same axis, and you took out the Luxembourg, Belgium surprise wild card that always seems to be uh, an offshore self-monetization uh, plan, who actually of the, the the outside America are actually buying? It sure isn't the Russians and the Chinese, and they and they aren't bidding anything like they used to. The appetite of debt is going to lead to an interest rate spike more than all the pivots and cuts is our been our position for a long time, especially with inflation. 
Give us your feed and thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, obviously the buyer of last resort or when it happens, the buyer of only resort will be the Federal Reserve. And you're probably looking at Federal Reserve action between behind uh, Luxembourg and uh, Belgium. That's, I, I, I don't believe that's real capital. Uh, I have been on the record saying that, uh, you know, there's been nothing but talk of rate cuts. Now they're talking about less rate cuts. Uh, yeah, if something, you know, if, if something bad happens financially, something breaks, yes, the Federal Reserve will cut rates. But it's my opinion that market rates will 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 go higher. Uh, you may, you know, you'll see a brief downward move in rates, but the direction of interest rates from here is up, not down. And one thing that's not been accounted for, uh, I guess you could say in our lifetimes, Francis, is risk, risk premium on the interest rates in the U.S. I mean, they, they talk about we have uh, real, we have real interest rates, positive interest rates, and I don't see that as the case at all. I mean, inflation is far outstripping the coupons that are, are issued on treasuries. That's a negative real interest rate. So it just seems to me that uh, rates are going to go higher and, and that will be a function of risk premium, which we've not seen in our lifetimes. Lenders must be compensated for the risk that they're taking. And in the U.S. for, you know, 50, 60 years or, or longer even uh, has been considered a risk free rate of return. And I think yeah. the big uh, the big awakening at some point, probably this year, is going to be, hey, wait a minute, there is risk in owning U.S. sovereign treasury debt. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. In fact, uh, I was uh, just looking for a tweet uh, that was showing all the junk foods uh, businesses and uh, how uh, their prices have gone up in the last two or three years. And you're looking at McDonald's on about over 100% and most of the other basket of junk food providers uh, in the 70 to 80 percent range and that's cheap food you know right. that's a lot of our working poor that are eating out there um, grabbing something quick on the run heading off to the office uh, it, there's no way that statistically that uh, is represented and I want to comment on the other point you made is that we were always told I did an MBA and every business analyzed had to be on the risk-free premium of the 10-year treasury which essentially was a zero risk investment if you weren't delivering an internal rate of return beyond that and the point you're raising is that entire fundamental principle almost no longer holds now on the basis of absolute prol proliferation and but and in actual fact the premium should already exist it should already be pretty damn high because we're standing at a guaranteed failure it's almost, and never mind that we actually have junk debt as well in HYG, how that is still trading at the levels that it's trading with such a, a category A splurge is beyond me. So, I mean, those are two very good points. I, I don't know if you have further to say on that, but it astounds me. I do. Yeah, one, one other point. Uh, the issuer of dollars themselves, the Federal Reserve, lost $156 billion last year. That more than wiped out their equity. So you have a, a multi-trillion, if you include derivatives, uh, two plus quadrillion dollar. Yeah, quadrillions, exactly. You have a system that's, the foundation is negative equity. Yeah. So you have, basically what, what we have is a Federal Reserve that's, that's broke you know, technically insolvent. And uh, oddly enough, and I, I talked about this last week, uh, oddly enough, last week, there was a, uh, I guess it was an undercover uh, story on the Fed that inside the Fed, they've become woke. They believe 
of, you know, their monetary policy has got to come back. Climate change has got to uh, align with DEI. So now you have a Fed that's woke and broke. And I mean, that is the world's reserve currency. That's what the world is running on, which is the, 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 the I guess the best way to say it is the world financial markets are running on fiction. Well, it's so funny to have the peak always a uh, nation state of capitalism actually being run by uh, a Marxist agenda, both culturally, socially, and quite clearly economically. Right. Yeah, it's a clown show. <laughs> so gold, uh, we, we've discussed debt. Tell us, are we not, is it not serving exactly its role? And I don't need to, in fact, it's probably worth also bringing up not just the gold chart, but the gold chart, uh, I'd like to bring up the gold charts versus uh, the yen because we've also had the dollar. Because of these rate cuts, we're actually getting this perverse result of dollar dominance at the moment, and it will be, and it will intensify. Right. Uh, in other words, this whole system fails on a dollar strength spike and an interest rate spring, uh, sp spike, which has to be led by the feds because they proliferated, they created the inflation. They now have to be at the forefront of fighting it as debt collapses, which will see in the order of collapse, the emerging market nations that are offshore dollar debt, uh, they're going to be forced into proliferating their currency to try buy dollars to make higher interest rate payments. And that's going to further exaggerate. So surely we're going to be due some serious FX volatility with a dollar being a wrecking ball on the smaller nations and then eventually we'll have the world economic forum saying we didn't need that many currencies and normalizing what tends what, what didn't need to happen How, how's your pecking order in the, the the i suppose the order of events the, these cylinders we've got a v12 here what's the firing order of collapse in terms of this yeah actually i mean it's it's hard to it's hard to look at at the order because there are so many potential to throw on this this bonfire uh, I would say first I would say if you think gold has been strong in the dollar look at gold in other currencies look at gold in euros look at gold in British pounds yen whatever gold is exploding and actually let me let me just go back gold's not exploding it's the currencies that are imploding correct because yes. The, the 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 common way of measurement is you you know you measure an ounce of gold and how many dollars or yen or euros or whatever it takes to buy that. In reality, that's not the case. An ounce of gold is from a hundred years ago, from a thousand years ago, is still just an ounce of gold. It's that yeah. same ounce of gold that is measuring stick. So really, this run, uh, gold has gone from one. Uh, 19 hundredth of a dollar to uh, I'm sorry, the, the dollar is is was one nineteen hundredth, now it's one one twenty four hundredth. So, what's happening is the the currencies themselves are imploding. It's not that gold and silver or even a cup of coffee or anything else is going up in value. What's happening is the currencies are declining and it's taking more currency. Um, as far as the the implosion, and and I do agree with you that a stronger dollar obviously is going to work as a wrecking ball in the financial system, and what that'll do is it will wreck uh, emerging market uh, financial systems because they simply won't have the dollars to repay, and that's yeah. what you're seeing now is that while so many of these contracts in the past were were done in dollars, and you've got uh, you have you have many entities scrambling to buy dollars to pay down their debt. And I mean that's bleeding off, but what that's gonna cause is it's gonna cause it's gonna cause some failures, it's gonna cause some defaults. And once you get defaults in a system that is leveraged as high or as 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 much as this system is leveraged, that infection spreads. And it spreads all the way up the chain and obviously ultimately to the reserve currency of the world, which is the dollar. Uh, and of course, uh, treasury debt itself 
as we spoke a little bit earlier, treasury debt itself is mathematically infected. It cannot be paid off in current terms. The only way to pay it off is basically to print the dollars, uh, which dilutes the dollar. So that's, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at a, a strong dollar that's cutting its own, own knees off by forcing newly created dollars to pay off the, the current and past debt. Yeah, that's it's absolutely right. I brought up the yen as you were speaking, Bill. And actually, since it made the 300,000 yen per ounce mark, having broken from the 145, which is already a doubling, it's actually gone into a parabola now against the yen, and it's at way up at 365. So that's probably of a first world currency as well. It's not, it's not the Turkish lira we're talking about. Uh, it's never bad to show that chart if we can get something, just what it means in emerging countries. That's against the, uh, and that's in a non-long log scale. I mean, there's some bad wicks on here. Let me just move that all. But I mean, that's against the lira. Uh, and I do feel uh, my, my uh, home state of South Africa will not be far off because they've been put not far off Turkey in terms of dollar debt. The only thing I think they have going for them is they still pull a bit of gold out the ground, though, um, but not quite to the same levels they used to. So we're going to see a rolling contagion of emerging markets that got the, the, the Perkins economic hitman model put on them and are sitting rich in right. uh, debt in dollars. Uh, so it's got to be an FX crisis, hasn't it? And uh, they're going to let it roll uh and knock them out and then that will see you see this capitalism didn't work you know too many currencies we need to have you know these uh central bank uh digital tokens and we just need you know a handful of them um or maybe even one i don't know what they are planning but it's uh, i don't trust them uh further than i can spit on them um and s silver a uh, little bit of yes it, it, it's not that capitalism didn't work what hasn't worked and what what can't work is uh, the fractional reserve debt money system. I mean, if we had a different system where nations were actually issuing uh, debt free currency, we wouldn't be where we are now. Oh, 100 percent. I'm, I'm saying capitalism doesn't work as their meme. You know, hey, it's broken. Meanwhile, they actively worked against it to break it. Uh, I agree 100 percent. Uh, it's the best system we have, uh, and there's clearly people that have set out to destroy it for nefarious reasons in my take. So um, we've also seen, Bill, coffee, the Arabica, the Robusta bean, cacao. Oh, my goodness, the cacao chart. Since we last spoke, we've had uh, selected soft commodities absolutely shooting it. Um, we have three ETFs that are in setups, a copper one. Um, and a, a gas and exploration ETF, and uh, and, and then the third one was actually in boats, haulage, uh, and mining and exploration. So it's actually four I've given you in, in all, all set up for upside and making upside. You've got those three softs I've mentioned that are absolutely ripping up. How can people actually expect anything but higher inflation numbers? uh with it why are the my it seems that it feels like i'm continually being gaslit i, I know not having your personal company around uh the bonfire ev every week everything i look at uh, the mainstream media which i'm trying to assess and sift through and even most other commentators are not talking about the fact that actually we're about to go into a serious increase in inflation and it has to be accompanied with right. interest rate spikes um, and I think that's captured media as part of my answer there. But uh, how do you see it playing out? Is there anything you would add to that? Are we going higher on inflation? Yeah, inflation, I mean, like you just said, cocoa, uh, coffee beans, I mean, just commodities in general. Uh, California just, just passed their $20 minimum wage. I mean, there's no question about it. Inflation's going higher. It's not going lower. Although at some point in time, we are going to have a, uh, obviously the financial collapse and there's your deflation and i've i've said for many years that we're going to have inflation of the things you need and have to have and deflation of the things you've already bought and what you own uh, you you did mention silver a little bit ago 
Um, it's interesting. Silver is actually trading at a two to three dollar premium uh, over New York and, and London in Asia. Gold is trading at roughly a forty dollar premium over uh, London and, and New York gold. And what that's created is an arbitrage. Simply, you buy in the West and you sell in the East, and you lock in, like I said, forty dollars on on gold, two or two or three dollars in silver. And you pay your shipping costs and you're left with a profit. It's a guaranteed trade. So yeah. gold and silver are being are being bled from the West to the East. I was um, just about to say, that's that, the travel sector. Pardon me? Yeah, no, sorry, I interrupted you okay. there. You, you nailed it. It's the travel vector as well. It's not just the arbitrage. It's showing you where good money is being valued properly and where it isn't. Well, right. And as we were just talking about uh, foreign currencies, because the dollar is stronger versus foreign currencies, you mentioned the, the yen, you could look at the yuan. Um, foreign currencies, because gold and silver, are, are when they're priced in those currencies, are showing much bigger percentage gains. So you've got more fear in foreigners that they're going to lose their capital versus real money. So you're, you're getting a, an onslaught of buying from the East. Now, interestingly enough, uh, I think it was this past Friday, I read an article where China is encouraging their citizens to buy silver. And I guess that's, you know, just because it's, it's cheaper to uh, the price of gold. I mean, we still have an eight, what, an 82, 83, 84 uh, gold to silver ratio. But to see China officially recommending to their citizens to buy silver, that's a billion and a half citizens. If every single citizen bought one ounce of silver, they would, I mean, what is the production of silver worldwide? A billion, billion to somewhere in that neighborhood. So they'd actually buy more silver that is produced in the whole world in a year's time. Yeah. And they listen and to one other thing. Yeah, one other thing on silver, uh, I think this green push that they've had for the last few years, I think that's coming home to roost because they're finally figuring out the amount of silver and, and other uh, rare earth, you know, other uh, minerals that are, are needed. Uh, they're finding out that, I mean, solar last year ate up 200, 300 million ounces of silver and, and we're not even ramped up to where they want to be by 2030. The silver doesn't exist. At, it certainly doesn't exist at this price. Yeah, very good points. Uh, absolutely agree. I saw the same article of the Chinese. I'd say they're a better financial advisor than uh, Bidenomics uh, has turned out to be uh, generally. Uh, and it very much seems like an orchestrated take down of one area where common sense, quieter, and more methodical uh, and more patient side is uh, going to win out. Uh, and that's why we're seeing this pricing. It's always been my peculiarity. We've spoken before about there always seemed to be a discount window. The East bought up metals and we sold the price down on the London through to the New York close uh, every time. So it seemed right. like we were building a discount window for them to accumulate in lieu of lost valuations on treasuries that they invariably are going to eat. Um, I think I think someone said uh, this is quotes verbatim. I didn't fact check it, but that those hundred year Austrian uh, debts have already lost in capital values around 60 percent that they issued at next to zero um, valuation. People don't understand the leverage of interest rates once you get really, really low. You know, if you double the interest rates, you halve the value of the bond. Right. So even if you're going from 0.5 to you know one percent. Uh, and that's what happens when you get when you've had such a perversion and compression on yield. And this, uh, I remember Jim Grant, you know, all his newsletters, you'd have the search for yield, the guy in the desert looking for a glass of water. And now we've gone, com we're going completely the other way. Never mind yield on capital, but just return the capital. Preservation of capital is the is now the new game. And uh, gold and silver is it. Uh, for those that buy gold and silver, Bill. Um, one thing I do highlight is they still need to have a bit of cash. We've spoken about that because 
the yield curve inversions uh, are starting to get perky. The 10-year just hit a new high. I had an alert pop right here uh, as part of that. And that's the longer term end. And we're slowly going to get a reversion back positive. And that's typically when you're on borrowed time for the next crisis. And when we had a small pre precursory chat, you were just mentioning it feels very much like 2019. We had the repo crisis in October that year, and then we went into the event that everybody knows. Uh, and you've got that same, talk about your 2019 deja vu feeling. Yeah, I mean, liquidity got tight, very tight in late 2019. They had to open the spigots and let me just put conveniently COVID came along and allowed them to uh, <laughs> open the spigots and, and create trillions of dollars. Uh, and, I, and that's where we are again now. Liquidity has gotten tight again. Uh, I do want to make a comment on, on what you had just said. I think the easiest way to explain that is the world collectively financially became a zero coupon bond. And if you know anything about zero coupon bonds, when interest rates move up or down, they are the most, they're the most volatile. I mean, obviously a one year T bill rates could go up or down. It doesn't matter because you only got a year before you, you collect your principal, but on a 30 year or like you were talking about the hundred year Austrian bond, the leverage is, is tremendous. So you've had a doubling in rates and when basically when you double rates, you're, you're cutting, uh, d interest discounted values, you're cutting them by 50%. So yeah. what I, I think I said when we first started that things are, assets are priced where they are now or got to where they, they were at the peak based, based on or fueled by credit. And now you're seeing the reverse because interest rates have gone up. Look at these hotels that are, are selling at 20 cents on 2015's dollar. That is not just a function of, of you know, lower occupancy. It's a function of interest rates have gone up and the pricing that they had years back, even at full occupancy, wouldn't make sense today because, because of the discounting mechanism you're using, uh, I don't know, commercial real estate, you're probably talking seven, eight, nine percent versus three, four, five percent five, six years ago. So it's the discounting process that is, it's destroying the collateral, we'll put it that way. Yeah. And on your point, you were talking about what things will go down and up as well. Um, the things you'll need will go up and the things you already have. I was going to add to that. The things you already have that were highly financially engineered, like, for example, right. fancy sports cars with uh, lease payments and balloon payments at the end over seven years where you're paying only 40 percent of it off. Good luck in the secondhand car market when you are part of the glut having been shaken out and having to sell off those right. uh, vehicles. Good luck in the, the, the peak bond uh, markets in terms of property mortgages in asset prices where most people have uh, leverage. There's not enough cash buyers to maintain the asset value at its current peaks when most people are buying. And I had, um, uh, I, I'm in touch with some people here and one of them is a big oil tanker a guy. He's, you know, multi, multi millionaire and he's got a development in the States and he's getting 100% finance for vets. And a lot of veterans are buying properties in Florida on essentially 100% finance. So this is a bit like the Fed, uh, a zero capital base inverted py pyramid where the pyramid gets exceedingly wide and stands on an incredibly thin dot that it's actually zero, uh, zero area dot. Uh, and that's still going on now in an environment where you and I see what we see and we and we see that uh, what is a vet who's probably later in years might be our kind of age group, maybe 10 years younger. Um, what does he see for his future income that's going to see him be able to maintain payments on that? That's assuming he doesn't have a fixed rate. I suppose most do, but I, I still don't see a good outcome on that. And the capital value of that property and how much do you think you'll pay off in 30 years uh, if he lives that long? 
Right. And the, the one thing you didn't mention is, okay, so let's say that you are, you are able to make your payments and, you know, you purchase a property for a quarter of a million dollars. You're able to make your payments. Everything's fine. Yet the, the, the values around you are collapsing. So yeah. even if you do hold the thing, you know, five years, 10 years, and that $250,000 property, you're looking at a $125,000 market you're, you know, you're underwater, even though you've made, made all your payments, you've got a negative equity in that property. And that's, yeah. that's the problem. Uh, you know, once they start doing appraisals and, and the, the other thing that's a problem is obviously refinancings, which we've not talked about. And that's, yeah. that's the real danger is when the refinancings and it's already happening when they can't be done, when they don't mathematically don't make sense, which is where we are now then you have uh entities walking away from the properties and that's just you know that's glutting the market this yeah. is going to be 2008 2009 on hyper steroids yeah it's difficult to have this conversation and not conclude exactly that that it's going to be far larger in scale um it, it's uh, yeah it's, it's it is absurd and uh, the other thing that people don't realize is that, like you mentioned with the person who does make his payment, is when whatever business you're in, that you're getting income to make your payment, everyone else is getting unemployed and those businesses are going bust, or they're cutting back to try and make earnings and meet their banking requirements. So eventually, right. your healthy business that sells to XYZ product or service no longer has any clients anymore, and you become a forced seller with negative equity, even though you were relatively strong. In other words, we're all reliant on the system maintaining some aspect of strength. Even I, uh, who's lucky enough to still be generating good income, um, if the rest of the world all dies, uh, there's nobody who, who can uh, continue to provide me income. And that that's why you become a forced seller, essentially. And I think this whole BlackRock agenda of, of buying properties and the immigrants that are being swum in and everything, it seems to be, and this you'll own nothing and be happy. I think they're going to let this one run and run and run. In 2008, they came, you know, eventually with the fire hoses and started their QE narratives. But even if they do do it, it's going to have a much less, more muted effect. The scale in numbers that they would have to do are mathematically, as you've made the point, so much more. You know, you would have to do tens of trillions uh, just to feel not dead, not to feel great, just to feel not dead. It will make the QE cycle of previous look almost uh, really small, you know, the 150 billion and the 250 billions will be at, at a whole new level if they were even to try. So surely they they seize this opportunity uh, to do their launch of their CBDCs. Or do we live another cycle of quantitative easing, just greater scale and go another spell before? This feels like the one to me uh, at the risk of um, saying it's different this time. Yeah, I think the real short, quick, easy way to put it is there are no white knights this time. Uh, what you have, what you had back in 2008, 2009, you talked about the fire hose. The, the sovereign treasuries and central banks, their balance sheets were poor, but they still had the ability to open that fire hose. They do not have the ability to do that now. Their balance sheets are wrecked. And the question is, who... Who or where is the white knight going to come from? Uh, to be honest with you, the only white knight I can think of is a massive revaluation higher in gold, which would aid those treasuries and those central banks that own gold to fix their balance sheets. The ones that have no gold whatsoever, their balance sheets are lost and will be, be ruined literally forever. I mean, that the, that those central banks, those treasuries, they're going to go away. Yeah. Uh, a, a small side note I'd like to add, Bill, uh, to this recent spell of gold strength and silver responding also a little bit, is that uh, Bitcoin was rather disappointing in the face of interest rates returns. And I've always put out a cautionary for people that brag about being all in and they've, you know, they 
they got courage, they've got the balls, if you can excuse the phrase. They're all in on their and uh, um, they're all in on the electronic digital uh, game to not look gold and silver in the eye. How would you? What would you say to uh, some of those Bitcoin maxis that are in my feed saying, you know, it's old school and everything, after the recent events uh, that we just had? Well, I think people are going to find out that Bitcoin is not a safe haven. Uh, and I think when all is said and done, they're going to find out that Bitcoin is nothing, that it's been digital air. Uh, and you've got people bidding on, on digits, basically. Uh, when this system goes down, and w when the system goes down, you need to be in a bunker, a physical bunker, and your financial your financial system situation needs to be. Uh, you're going to get to the point to you have what you have, and that's all you have. And what I'm talking about is, I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm kind of morphing toward the great taking because that's where this world is going. When yeah. brokers go down, when banks go down, when insurance companies go down, they're gonna take your money to try to keep themselves solvent. So basically, yeah. uh, you know, there's there's your, your reasoning or story why you wanna own gold and silver, because they cannot bankrupt. And you can hold those in your hand. Whereas uh, if it, we have grid down, if we have internet down or whatever, financial assets and and obviously cryptos they won't have any any worth no way to trade them you're stuck and i think once we get stuck people are going to find out once markets reopen you know oh my god markets closed and bitcoin was 60,000 now it's 273 on its way to zero yeah because that is the intrinsic value in my opinion of bitcoin I, I or Bitcoin, all cryptos. I I believe the blockchain is fabulous. It's a perfect accounting system, but it's it's a perfect accounting system of nothing. Yeah, people should definitely be cautious that are watching that that are all in on crypto. Says Bill, you may turn out holding um, not that much uh, and an apportionment at minimum to the legacy, long-standing, multi-millennial. Uh, value holders of gold and silver would uh, certainly serve you well. What else, uh, Bill, have you seen during the course of this week that you'd like uh, all our viewers to hear and be aware? What's popped for you that you'd be interested to take us part? Uh, nothing in particular, but it does look to me like a lot of the, the gaslighting narratives are starting to fall apart one by one. Uh, pretty much no matter what you look at, there's, there's, I mean, you, you could look at COVID, you could look at the vaccines. Uh, I mean, there's, there's any number of things you can look at. ESG, where the official climate change. Yeah, exactly. All of those, uh, all of that, there are, there are threads everywhere and those threads are being pulled on. And the the obvious and blatant lies that have been foisted upon the population, they are slowly, surely, and methodically coming forward. So I just, it to me, it, it just looks like the fake narratives are are starting to crack, and the light of truth is is beginning to glimmer, beginning to shine. And I think that will that's only going to increase. It will move uh exponentially as and as that happens you're going to see the the financial markets exponentially implode it seems like a, a a bit of truth is creeping out and that positioning on principle and showing patience uh and believing in sound money eventually does and can and will pay and that's we're starting to see little glimmers of light at the end of this tunnel almost. It's quite a positive message, if you don't mind me framing it as such, for gold and silver stackers. Yeah. What, one other comment. Uh, it looks, because gold is broken out, now you've got silver sniffing at 30. Once it gets through 30, you should see some really wild action. Uh, what you're seeing with these higher prices 
it's creating margin calls. Generally, assets, when they drop in value, that creates margin calls because the leverage is to the long side. But the leverage in gold and silver for years has been to the short side. So what you're, what you're seeing is yeah. that each dollar higher uh, in gold and silver is creating a larger and larger margin call, which will coincide with what, what ultimately had to happen is a failure to deliver because the, the paper system cannot keep getting bigger and bigger while the amount of gold and silver available for purchase for investment, I mean, that grows by what, one and a half percent per year. So we're getting to the point now where uh, the physical markets are getting very tight. And, and at the same time, the, the financial, the paper markets in gold and silver, you're, be, you're seeing margin calls across the board with these higher prices. So when you have, a, when you have the, this mo giant margin call, and the world is a giant margin call, when you have this margin call and everything's collapsing, gold and silver are going to have to be bought from, a financial, from the financial side to meet the margin calls. But on top of that, we're going to find out that there are so many uh, paper ounces outstanding for every one real ounce that this failure to deliver, you're going to find just an absolute mad scramble. And gold and silver will soak up all of the scared money. And I say scared, never forget, fear is a greater emotion than greed. Indeed. Motivator, yeah. 100%. I love that. And the way you describe the suppression, eventually when it unveils, you're going to get catapulted with such force that you've simply not seen uh, before in any market. I think this transcends the 80s bull market. I think it transcends everything. You're essentially talking about the end of a system. And part of that trade right. may end, eventually not end up being on the screens. We go complete counterparty risk failure. You'll see it. It will stop. And as you pointed out, the revaluation option where people, something, you know, no one talks about coming out and saying it's a hundred thousand uh, dollars an ounce of gold or two, even more uh, bigger numbers becomes only option to shrink down that failed debt and those obligations. Once they have uh, almost, we're going to be, it's kind of like Fort Knox is being forced to be audited again by virtue of the derivative. And we're going to find out how much there really is and who has it. Uh, and as you're saying, this because of the uh, extremity of the fraud that has been perpetuated on an unfettered basis for such so many years, the the leverage piled upon leverage is so so huge that the only outcome is an incredible revaluation for both metals in our take. Uh, and I think people are looking at. I think you're casting pearls and you're giving people the key to wealth with what you've just said to our audience today. Um, and, you know, if they think we're both lunatics, they should maybe just humor us and just get a couple of ounces. Uh, a cup, if you have 10 ounces of gold uh, compared to the man next door, you're probably going to have a living existence uh, just with a, what I consider a fairly paltry holding, which is still at the moment less than 20 to 24 grand uh, right now. What's your take? What's the level? Uh, do you have any views? I mean, it's guesswork, I suppose, but do you have a take? Oh, uh, the final price of gold? On an existence. What could fund an existence? Just to pay a house off in full and, and okay. have some yeah. degree of balance sheet. Yeah, I've actually had a bunch of people because we finally, you know, got this move up in gold. I've got had a bunch of people ask me, you know, I have a mortgage and I've got gold and I can pay my mortgage off with the gold. Should I do it? And my answer is, well, so if you locked in three and a half or four percent on a mortgage and it's tax deductible and it's it's fixed, it's locked in. Why would you why would you pay uh, a mortgage down with real money today? This is going to have yeah. far more value at a later date. Why not pay it back at a later date with their monkey money? And yes. I think, I mean, I've done this for years. Whenever I have taken debt out in the past, I've always had gold equal to that debt. So I know mentally at any top point in time, I could pay that debt off. 
And I think that's the best way to, to think about it is mentally hold metal versus your debt. Don't, I don't think it's a great idea to pay your debt off with something uh, that's gonna, gonna go astronomical. And I mean, you use the number of 100,000. In my opinion, in, in my mind, the only question is how many zeros are gonna be at the end of a gold price and a silver price? Because you, I mean, how many zeros are there in the system? And when that system fails, those zeros are going to scamper toward gold and silver and add zeros to them. Yeah. Yeah. I do think it's the gamification process is there's some number that is really 100,000 and beyond. Because I think the truth of the matter is we don't really know the full extent of the skullduggery that's going on. They're very good at... Uh, it's kind of like a hotel that's getting refurbed. It has this beautiful frontier, this frontage, and actually behind it, they prep propping it up with sticks and there's no building at all. You know, they're still cobbling together a shed and you've got this grand, you know, uh, uh, Versailles palace uh, uh, frontage. And uh, I, I think once the curtains pull back, people will realize that the, the, it only was worse. I think with Madoff and everything where you've had events like this, the the full exposure, FTX, for example, that you know WhatsApp group chats and just sending money out and sending things and no accounting, you're astounded always by the absolute degree. And I think this system, with all its various mechanisms, because it's so much of a bigger lie, everybody thinks it's well run. And they're going to be astounded behind each little aspect, each little uh, spigot, as you say, each little hub. Uh, there's going to be an, 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 an umpteen uh, sins of great uh, beyond monkey business, as you said, monkey money and absolute monkey business going on. And I think we are starting to see some respect come to people like yourself and others like you who have had these opinions on precious metals for all this uh, time. Imagine what it's going to be like uh, when we really get going, because we haven't really started. I actually want to show you one chart. I'm desperate to show you because you'll appreciate this. Uh, we spoke about their, their stats uh, and what we feel about BLS and their take on statistics. And I've got uh, a really interesting chart that I think you'll love. Um, we have a particular approach towards uh, trading that involves uh, a volatility squeeze in its structure. And when I divide the gold chart, so this is the gold futures chart, it includes the 80s hump, we've got quite a bit of history here. And I'm gonna divide it by the CPI uh, official number, which we've already made our opinions felt on how much, but look, it's their number, we know that, and we'll go with it. This is, the, this is how the gold chart looks uh, on a, it's a monthly chart, first of all, so every candle represents a single month. And there's many people that say, well, I've missed out. I'm kind of, it's too, it's too late, you know, I've missed out. And I, for those people watching this right now, um, this is one of the biggest technical setups of our favorite volatility squeeze we've probably ever had, uh, with very few exceptions. And the, the move this takes is very strongly to the upside. And we only consider it an official break when it's taken this third high out. So it's three impulses with uh, ever greater constriction. And most of this constriction has come along the lows, it's important to point out. And for those that think it's too late, when we do our target on this, this so you're getting a weird value. You've got gold divided by a CPI number. So at the moment, that number, which is quite meaningless, is 7.6. The target on this is 52, and we expect it obviously to overrun. Targets are never just met and stopped on a dime on it. And that that 52 is, is about eight times or seven times more than where it is now. And that's on top of their official annual inflation. So just to stay at 7.6, gold would have to go up at their inflation rate. To go up a further seven times on that, what's probably going to end up a double digit number, I just want people to conceptualize what, uh, what you're looking at as a gold price. And this chart and this technical setup 
probably makes me about as bullish as I could possibly be. I'll just going to put a drawing tool on and draw that target because we can uh, make the visualization of that a little bit better. Uh, and this, as we say, is on their number, which none of us truly actually uh, are happy with, uh, as you stated quite eloquently yourself. Sorry, one sec. Let me just see if I can get this to draw. Whoops. And it's still the most massive cup and handle chart you've ever seen. Yes, there's a couple of technical interpretations. I'm actually failing on my draw tool here. Uh, I'll have to stay with a the sketch. There's also what you've just described, which is a huge cupping with a handle, and the handle's now had its handle. <laughs> so the, the, what I'm highlighting is that the dips are getting much shorter and far less deep, and this one is busy, busy concluding with an upside move against their CPI stats, and the target is up there. And this is a log scale chart as well. So um, I, I just think for those of you that think it's too late, you know, you can accumulate in the next three months. You might still have time. You may have three months. You might have six months. I'll actually ask you what your take is on it. But I think gold is going to be trading generally up. Even an average worker should be able to accumulate 10 ounces of gold over a three to six month period if you if you if you focus on it even if you have debt and as bill said use the monkey money to pay them back on the debt this asset class is now going to be overperforming. don't kill your golden goose to pay back something that is dying um in your debt so what would you say on those thoughts anything you would add there bill yeah i think that's uh way overly optimistic that the, that an average worker in three to six months time could accumulate 10 ounces of gold um, they could accumulate 10 ounces of silver maybe 100 ounces of silver but the average worker living you know paycheck to paycheck so uh, but yeah just do the best do the best you can yeah. make sure you put some food away uh, if you do have additional finances you want to protect get them out of the system get them into gold and silver they can't bankrupt and they can't be taken away from you um, I think one of the things you said earlier was was right on um, and I'll add that this is a the world is a or the Western world the financial system is a Ponzi scheme represented by a Potemkin village you know beautiful facade and rotten rotten underneath or behind yeah and that's all going to be exposed and the same people are going to be behind the new digital system, which Bitcoin appears to be an on-ramp right. for, and a diversion away from precious metals and owning things physically. That's going to happen. I do think that they are trying to introduce uh, central bank digital currencies, but I think ultimately they're going to fail because it's still debt money. Now, yeah. if they did a central bank digital currency and did it with national currencies that were not debt-based, you know, I think you might be onto something there. But that's not what they're going to try to do. I mean, yeah. what what they're going to try to do is is bring they're going to try to wash the pig and bring it back out. And it's a brand new shiny pig, but it's still a pig. <laughs> Lipstick, indeed. Excellent, Bill. Uh, thank you for the chat today. We really appreciate it. It's great having you on. Totally aligned minds. Um, how do people engage with you? Please tell them how they can find out uh, more from you and get more of your wisdom. Yeah, you can go to my website. It's about a year old now. It's simply billholter.com. Uh, there is a contact button if you want to try to reach me. I have recently uh, changed my my business email. It's bholter at proton.me. bholter at proton.me. Excellent. We'll put those in the show notes, uh, Bill. Thank you very much for your time. Any final uh, wishes in terms of how anything else that people should do outside of gold and silver preparing for this? Because it's all quite foreboding. For someone new, this is we, we sound like doomsday prophets, really, aren't we? We're calling for everything to fall down and saying how rotten it is inside. Um, but there's a positive message. It's an end of something that's potentially pretty dark. What should they do? Well, just do the best you can. That's all you can do. Do the best you can in every aspect of your life, whether it be uh, financially, uh, socially, uh, psychologically, spiritually. Just be prepared for anything and everything because 
you know, nobody knows exactly how this is going to go down. And I think even the most, the most prepared people are still, they will have forgotten some things and, they'll, and they will have missed some things. So don't beat yourself up when this comes to pass and you forgot to do this or you forgot to do that. Just do the best you can now and don't worry about that later. Just do the best you can. Yeah, absolutely. It's not about perfection in this time. There's so many landmines, um, but any preparation right. is better than none. Uh, and the further you take it, the stronger you'll be. Excellent. Bill Halter, thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, we look forward to when you have it back on. And I wonder what the gold price will be then. Who knows? Thanks for having me, Francis. Absolute pleasure.